Most of you know by now that my cooking skills came from a lack of cooking skills in my family. But there, there was one sort of tradition meal that I just love, that most Jews love, which is the bagel and lox spread. You've got your bagels, you've got your cream cheese, your whitefish, your toppings, a lox, all that good stuff. You build an insane sandwich. And the bagel and lox spread was so tasty and it was such an integral part of the Jewish tradition that Jews were basically finding any excuse to, you know, to serve that type of food at holidays and uh, weekends. Sometimes for dinner, I would have bagel and lox spread. It was just so good and you really couldn't mess it up, which was the best part about it. After breakfast, they fall apart, the juice. After a bagel, a cream cheese, lox, where are they going? They got nothing. They have nothing. So for episode 11 of the sandwich series, we're gonna create the bagel and lox sandwich completely from scratch. But first we need a little history lesson on how this sandwich became so popular in the Jewish culture. Now the bagel shape is centuries old. There's no surprise there. I mean, it's a really practical design with a ton of advantages. One being that it's a ring shape so you could stack them on a stick or put them on a string, which helped a lot with transporting these breads. Now this type of bread dates all the way back to the Romans and even the Chinese were making bread with a hole in it centuries ago. But the current popularity of the word and term bagel dates back to the 14th century where German immigrants were bringing over different pretzel style breads to Poland to give them energy and power to help build the economy. And the theory goes that a group of Polish bishops forbid Christians to buy any type of food no. from Jews, hinting that they contain poison for the unsuspecting Gentile. So Jews were allowed to work with bread only if the bread was boiled first before baked, which is why bagels today are boiled. And by the time Eastern European Jews were immigrating in masses to the United States at the turn of the 20th century, the bagel came right along with them through Ellis Island and landed right here in NYC at countless bakeries. The question is, how did these three elements come together to create the, the popular sandwich we have today? And the history lies right here in New York City. This was an American-made sandwich, and it all happened because of the explosion of the Eggs Benedict, which in the 1930s was one of the most popular brunch items, which is very, very unkosher, so the Jews had to adapt. And they created the substitute with subbing out the bagel for the English muffin, the lox for the ham or bacon, and the cream cheese for the hollandaise sauce. Thus, the new Jewish American classic had arrived on the scene. All right, we got the history out of the way, but before we go into the cooking process, we gotta learn how to make some bagels from scratch. So we're headed over to the Bagel Hole, which has been supplying the neighborhood of Park Slope delicious bagels for decades. I learned how to roll bagels from an old Jewish gentleman. He was from Poland. He came here, I believe he came here during World War II, and he he knew how to make a lot of things, not just bagels. I got it. And uh, so he was two, he was like 80 years old, 70 years old when he was there, and he couldn't, he couldn't lift the bags of flour. Mm. So I used to help him put the flour in, take the dough out for him and he started to teach me how to roll bagels. He was from where the, the bagel came from, yes. basically. Yes. So you've got skills from the <laughs> motherland of bagels. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Phil, so I'm the owner of Bagel Hole. We're here 32 years, established in 1985. Did you start this place? Yes, it was me and my brother You're originally good. started here. My father helped us. How'd you get into the bagel business? I started working as a teenager in the neighborhood bagel shop where I used to live. How long have you been in the bagel business? Since I'm 17. Wow. Yeah, I'm so 50, you, uh, 56 now. Why do you think it's so popular in New York, bagels? Well, the bagel was first introduced here, and I think it pretty much stayed here for many years, and until really when people started moving. They and took I, the bagel when I they guess they, out. Right, besides that, I guess people missed it because you couldn't get it anywhere else. 
Um, in the 70s, I believe, you know, past New York, New Jersey, nobody knew what a bagel was. Lenders Bagels, he's actually the one that introduced bagels to um, the rest of the country when he started mass producing them and freezing them and, you know, you can buy them in the supermarket. In fact, as a little boy, I remember eating those bagels. When I got into this business, a lot of people didn't know what a bagel was or they never had one. When, when do you think that started to change? I think in the mid 80s. In my opinion, a lot of people were making money with the stock market doing so well, so they went into businesses. About that time is when the rack oven was introduced, and what the rack oven does, it steams the bagel and bakes the bagel in one process. So you actually re wheel the whole rack inside the oven. Instead of boiling the bagel, they would steam it. Between that and the, and the bagel machine, anybody could make a bagel. When it comes to making bagels, What's the, the process from start to finish? So in the mixer right now, we, we got some flour in there, some malt with water, some yeast, salt. It mixes for about 20 minutes, depending on the, the size of the dough. And after that, we come take them out, let them re relax a little, and then we hand roll the bagels. And when that's done, we proof them. That's about a half hour, 45 minutes, depending on the temperature. And uh, after that, they go into the walk-in box, and we let them sit in there for at least a day. Some, you know, two days is probably better, but at least one day, and then uh, then it's the baking process, and they go into the kettle, the hot water. And does that change like the texture or anything? Well, that's where you'll get your crust from. Then they go on the boards, and there we put the seeds on them, and then they go in the oven for a few minutes to dry, and then we flip them, and after that, it's about a 12-minute bake. Phil, right. anything else you want to say? Or are you good? No, I'm good. <laughs> wanna, did my alarm go up yet? What I love about Phil is he's probably the least scientific or precise baker that I've, that I've ever experienced. The guy just has bagel in his blood. He's been doing it for years and he just does it by feel, which for me takes the intimidation out of it. Seeing him just get in there and just kind of, you know, throw things together and make incredible bagels, very inspiring. So I'm gonna finish this bagel hole, everything bagel with cream cheese and get home and make some homemade bagels. So for our bagels, we're gonna start off with just blooming a little bit of yeast. We've got half a cup of warm water with one package of active yeast. I stir in one tablespoon of sugar and just let that dissolve and activate for about 15 minutes. Now you could do this handmade or with a mixer, of course, but bagels have a very you know dense and chewy dough, so it needs a lot of mixing. So a mixer will really help with your bagel recipe. We're gonna add eight cups of bread flour to the mixer and then 20 grams of salt. Phil was nice enough to give me some of that malt syrup, which really gives the bagels a traditional flavor, but you could use honey or maple syrup instead. I'm gonna add about three tablespoons of it. Now bagels are a pretty dense dough, so I'm doing a 55% hydration level, which basically just means 55% of the flour is the amount of water that you're gonna use. Now add your activated yeast and just let that go for about 20 minutes. When your dough has been mixed, you can just let it sit on the board for about 20 minutes to relax. Then you're ready to roll out your bagels. And I'm just following the same technique that I saw Phil do. Just cut off a little piece, roll that out into a snake-like form, and then fold that over my hand and just roll out the seam so you have a nice circle. And the, the hole can be much bigger than your final result because they are gonna proof and they are going to rise and that hole is gonna close up. I'm gonna sprinkle on a little cornmeal on my tray just so they don't stick and place those on there and let them sit out for about 30 minutes just to start the proofing process. Then I just stack the trays on top of each other so they have room to really get that air and develop the crust and I put them in the fridge overnight. We've got our bagel racks ready to proof in the fridge and you don't have to proof them in the fridge overnight but it will develop more flavor because you're slowing down the fermentation but there's still a lot of bacteria action and also leave them uncovered so they develop a nice crust. I'll see them tomorrow. So for the bagel toppings, you can you can do whatever you want. That's the best part about making homemade bagels. I wanted to go with the classic everything. That's always been my favorite, but I was missing a few things. So I just went with what I had, which was white sesame seeds, some black sesame seeds, 
poppy seeds and flaky sea salt. I didn't have the onion or garlic flakes, but you know, those, those tend to burn a lot in the oven, so I'm all right with holding those. To cook up these bagels, you gotta have a little bagel station. So we have our pot of boiling water, we've got our tray of bagels and our toppings. Now to the boiling water, we're just gonna add one tablespoon of baking soda and about two tablespoons of malt syrup. And this is just gonna help with the color and a little bit of the flavor. And then in batches, you're gonna boil the bagels for one minute each side. Then take them off on a plate and then you're gonna go right into the seeds. I like doing both sides for extra flavor. And then go back onto the tray and get those in a preheated 500 degree oven for about, I would say, start them 10 minutes and then flip them halfway and then do another five to 10 until they are just golden brown and crispy. A beautiful combination between soft and chewy on the inside, but what's most important about a bagel that I'm learning is, is the crust. Letting them dry out, boiling them, they all add this insane crispy layer to the outside, and that's why it's so important to get fresh bagels because you start losing that crust over time, and this is, this is insane. So we're making everything homemade, which includes the cured salmon, the lox, but first I wanted to get a sample of, you know, some of the best stuff in the city. So I actually headed out to Russ and Daughters, which is in the Lower East Side, actually, a block away from Katz's from episode nine. And we're gonna head over there for a little sample. Russell Daughters is considered an appetizing store. It's not a deli. So in Jewish culture, a lot of people follow kosher restrictions. So you need to separate meat and fish and dairy. So the deli serve the meat, and then the appetizing stores serve things like smoked and cured fish with different varieties. They'll have, you know, the dairy, the different spreads, cream cheese, white fish. They'll have some pickles in there. They've got dried fruit, some candy. They got a bit of it all, and they make the most incredible bagel and lox sandwich. So the classic, you start with your bagel of choice, you spread on your cream cheese, you go on with all of your fresh sliced lox. And then the traditional toppings would be some tomatoes, some red onions, and some capers to really bring it all together. So for my homemade lox, I've got a nice one pound piece of Alaskan salmon right here. You know, different styles of salmon will give you a different texture. This one's a little more fatty, but I, you know, is looking beautiful, so I went for it. And the cure is really easy. All you have to do is add half a cup of salt, half a cup of sugar, some lemon zest, and then a little bit of dill. I just cut that right in and just stirred up that curing mixture. And then you're just gonna layer it on your fish and make sure you have a dish that will collect liquid because the, the mixture is going to absorb liquid right out of the fish. And place a nice heavy weight on there. I'm just using a Tupperware with some water on it and place that in the fridge for about two to three days until it is completely cured. I just realized that the cure didn't really penetrate through the skin. On the top, it's great. You can taste the sweetness and the saltiness, but it's a little raw down at the bottom. So I think I'm gonna take the skin off, put some salt and sugar on that side so it penetrates through right here. Yep, it's totally raw right there. Still raw salmon, not much penetration. I added the same mixture heavily to that one side. Back in the fridge we go. So the last element we're making from scratch is the cream cheese. And I'm pretty excited for this because I've made fresh cheese before, but I've never cultured cheese. So if you see a cream cheese recipe without cultures, that's not really cream cheese. It's not gonna have that tangy bite that you're used to from store-bought stuff. So we are going to make the traditional stuff. <laughs> 
So you're gonna start out by heating up equal parts cream and milk. I'm using four cups each. You wanna make sure they're not ultra pasteurized or the culture won't work right. Heat up the milk to about 75 to 80 degrees. So here's my culture, it's called mesophilic cheese starter and I'm just gonna sprinkle in a quarter teaspoon of that right on the top surface. And then we're gonna add in our liquid rennet, which will separate the curds from the whey. And I just dissolve about three drops into a little bit of water and pour that in. Now just let that sit at room temperature around you know 70 to 75 degrees for 12 to 18 hours. And you'll see over time, we'll start to get thicker like a yogurt. And this is the culturing process. After your cream cheese is fully cultured, we have to separate the whey from the curds. Nothing seems to be working today, but this one is definitely my fault because they said it would drip through the cheesecloth and I thought if I layered it multiple times, I wouldn't have a problem, but it's dripping right through. So, plan B. A clean rag does seem to be doing the trick. You can see just the clear way is dripping down. What you really need is something called butter cloth, which is really fine, but this will work. Here's my final rig right here. We've got dish towel, rubber bands, a little extra tape for support, hook hanging from the cabinet because you need the weight of the cheese so the whey will fall out. You can't just lay it in the actual strainer. And we'll let that go for maybe eight hours until I get a nice thicker consistency. It's been about eight hours. We have a ton of whey collected. Look at all of that. So I'm gonna pull it and see where we're at. There we go. Look at that right there. Oh my goodness. That is so good. <laughs> so I'll salt this base to taste and then I'm gonna turn half of this into sky and cream cheese and the other half plain too. Can we just take a second to admire the texture of this cream cheese right out of the fridge? It's perfection. And the thing about it is Philadelphia cream cheese has such a monopoly that I don't think I've ever tasted fresh cream cheese like this. It is just blowing my mind. So this is a standard version, but scaled down, of course, of what a bagel and lox spread would look like. You've got your bagels, your multiple types of cream cheese. We've got the plain, the scallion. We've got the lox here, and then these are the standard toppings of choice. Russ and Daughters, that's what they serve. Pretty standard all over the board. Tomato, capers, onions. Sometimes people will throw in some lettuce and some, you know, some other random things, but right here, that's what the kids were going crazy for. It's all about creating like wavy layers with the locks. I think I'm gonna go cream cheese on the other side. Look at that thing right there, just beautiful. So there was a holiday called Yom Kippur and it was all about repenting for your sins. So you had to fast for the entire day, which was pretty intense as a kid. You know, most kids have never experienced fasting and you're going the entire day without eating. So it was just, it was just very difficult to get through. But at the end, we had the lock spread every single time. Bagels, just so intense. And just imagine going the whole day as a child and then making, like I would make the most insane sandwiches and just get after them. Sometimes I would eat way too many sandwiches because I had no idea like how to break a fast, but this is how it was done. Mm. I love when you bite into a sandwich and you don't just get flavor, but you get nostalgia with the bite. Like the first initial bite, it's, it's a crazy combination of flavors here, which is very unique, but it also just transports me back to when I was just destroying these things as a kid. And that's something special. And I think a lot of sandwiches do that. And I've realized that throughout this entire series, it's just this strange combination that comes together and it just like makes it within popular culinary culture 
and you got a sandwich for a lifetime. And uh, the bagel and lox is definitely a lifetime sandwich. So make sure you make this. Follow me at Life by Mike G. Again, I'm always teasing out these sandwiches, giving away prizes for whoever gets the sandwich right. And uh, I'll see you for episode 12. I've got a very, very special one coming for episode 12. So stay tuned on Life by Mike G if you want to be involved in that episode. Cream cheese was actually created by a New York farmer named William Alfred Lawrence in 1861. So William had a big cheese factory and at the time there was more demand from the middle and upper class to get food directly from the farm. And they also wanted to eat fancy like Europeans with all their specialty cheeses. So William at the cheese factory increased the fat content of his cheese by adding cream and gave it a nice fancy packaging and people just seemed to really love it. As demand and competition continued to grow for cream cheese, William rebranded his product to Philadelphia cream cheese because Philadelphia was known for having the best dairy farms in the nation. So it didn't come from Philadelphia, it came from upstate New York. He was just using the term to, to trick people basically. And then in 1903, the Phoenix company bought the Philadelphia trademark and in 1928, they merged with the food giant Kraft, which is what we know today, Kraft Philadelphia cream cheese.